We're glad you joined us again for The View from Hampton U. We're your hosts, Stephanie Sutton. And Joseph Walters. Stephanie, we've got a really special treat for our viewers today, don't we? That's correct. Our guest host is none other than the Dean of Scripps Howard School of Journalism and Communications and celebrated television broadcaster, Mr. Brett A. Pulley. Yes, and he invited several experts to the studio to discuss the importance of STEM in the black community. Let's take a look. When a boy, oftentimes as young as nine or 10, is recognized to exceed his peers in terms of size, speed, and athletic prowess, various entities in our society quickly notice and take this fledgling prodigy under their proverbial wings. An entire sports industrial complex comprised of coaches, camps, clinics, agents, and managers becomes available to this young child, all there to prepare him to become an engine that will generate millions for many in the world of professional sports. Today, as I speak, there are 450 jobs for players in the NBA, or National Basketball Association, and there are 1,696 jobs for players in the NFL, or the National Football League. However, at the same time, there are millions of high-paying jobs in STEM, or STEM, a league, if you will, that is far larger and far more lucrative. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. It is the league that creates successful doctors and scientists. It creates young millionaires at firms such as Facebook, Google, and Instagram. Over the span of a career, a person in this league stands to earn millions of dollars. And according to the U U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, there will be more than 1.2 million job openings in STEM within the next four years. How do we get our young people prepared for this bounty of opportunity? I'm Brett Pulley, the Dean of Hampton University's Scripps Howard School of Journalism and Communications, and welcome to The View from Hampton U. Our topic is why the so-called STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and math, are critical to the future of our young people, and how can we get them interested and prepared for careers in these areas. Joining me in this discussion, to my far right, Dr. Calvin Lowe, the Dean of the School of Science at Hampton University. To my immediate right, Mr. Enrico Rick Copeland, CEO and President of the Raleigh, North Carolina-based Global Health Connections International. And between the two of them, Dr. Carol De Davis, a professor in the Scripps Howard School at Hampton University. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Lowe, I'd, I'd, I'd like to start off with you uh, as it relates to STEM and, and really give us the, I think, the big picture of why the STEM-related careers are important, uh, especially as it pertains to African Americans and Latinos. Well, Brett, you know, certainly as you look at um, almost everything that we, that we do now, technology, the telephones and smartphones and computers and new um, drugs to cure uh, new diseases and, and old diseases. The STEM disciplines are really the foundation of, of all of that, the chemistry, the biology, the mathematics, computer science, um, studies of the environment, studies of, um, of you know, space. I mean, all of this stuff is built on top of an understanding of the, uh, and the STEM disciplines. And so if you want to be a person who contributes to um, the advancement of those, uh, those areas, then the STEM disciplines are the place that you start. Rick, tell us about Global Health Connections International, uh, what it is and what kind of work are you doing with your company uh, to get young people interested in these fields? Okay, well, basically we have uh, three pillars that we work on. One deals with global health and that is to help students understand the opportunities in the global market. When you look at the number of consumers outside of the United States, about 95% of the consumers are outside of the United States. So when you start to look at opportunities for young people, we want to be able to help them understand the things that they need to focus on. So there are a number of internship programs sponsored by the U.S. government underneath the Global Health Fellows Program. That's how I first came to know about these opportunities. Free programs offered by the government. So we work with 
HBCUs, the work that we've done here at Hampton, uh, at North Carolina Central University, at North Carolina a and to help build that pipeline for students to go abroad, to yes. understand those opportunities. The other piece that we do is advocacy work, and that's going back and forth to Washington, working with members of Congress. Uh, we've been very fortunate to uh, work with Representative Bobby Scott hmm. here in this area, uh, pushing forth the Global Health Fellows Program to ask those questions, why aren't HBCUs more involved in being able to have their students participate in the global opportunities? Yes. And then the third piece that we've developed is the STEM program itself. Because one of the things that we were finding in traveling abroad, the number of the people from a solution standpoint are not us. It's mostly white females. Hmm. And so going into the village with my camera gear versus those uh, camera folks who were under contract, I was being given access to the villages. So the thought for me was, well, wait a minute. If we start building a pipeline with more students who look like the villagers and help them to provide solutions to eradicate poverty and health disparities, then we might be able to build a longer term, more sustainable effort to eradicating poverty and health disparities. So uh, that is what we've been doing the past three years and uh, very excited about the opportunities. But one of the things that's still very troubling is our students don't want to tackle the rigors of science and math. Hmm. So the big question is, from an education <clears throat> standpoint, is how do we make STEM relevant? Yes. How do we make it fun? And so those are the things that I think we really need to address because uh, I was reading a, a, a study last night. Hmm. Chem 101 has become a weeding out course. Hmm. And so if you're weeding students out and you look at the statistics from the American Association of Medical Colleges of last year, for the first time in 32 years, black males in medical school, the number was the same as it was 32 years ago. And two thirds of the black students are females. So that's a problem. Sure it is. I want to talk some more about, about that and how we get young people, mm -hmm. instead of weeded out how we in fact uh, uh, start to develop that pipeline mm -hmm. that you mentioned. I want to ask you, Dr. Carol Davis, <laughs> I know that you have uh, uh, a creative approach to getting young people <clears throat> involved in the STEM disciplines. Talk a bit about that. Well, it's, it's just so we're very excited, first of all. I mean, we're, we're having a ball, as you know. Um, you know, first thing is we're creating things that students, they use every day. I mean, if you have a child, if you're a student or if you have a, a child who is playing around with makeup, you, you're doing STEM. You know, mixing up colors, you're doing STEM. Mixing up fragrances, you're doing STEM. If you cook and change the recipe, you're already doing STEM. So you don't have to, the parents and students don't have to think that they can't do STEM. They do STEM every day. Yeah. So what we're doing to make it relevant is taking some of the things that they love, which of course, perfume, we all love perfume, <laughs> and hair, we all love hair. We like to change our look. <laughs> and we're taking those two things and using them as an opportunity to have students come together and create these things in science, technology, engineering, and math, whatever combination is relevant. And we're shooting a reality show around it, so they're going to have a lot of fun doing it. And, uh, you know, creating consumer products that we can also generate revenue with, which is also very important for students because, as we know, students are not only getting involved in STEM, but we also want them to become STEM entrepreneurs mm. so that they understand that they can sustain themselves like Madam C.J. Walker did, like, you know, countless other people, Glory Foods has done. We want them to know that they can sustain themselves in STEM careers, so we're going to show them how to take the, the, the from concept all the way through to market, and they will understand that they can do STEM, they can love STEM, STEM is fun, it's entertaining, they're doing it anyway, and guess what? You can make money too. Yes. That's a home run. Yes. And, and, I, and, and, and as we, we, Dr. Lowe and I have talked so much about the science side of it, and you know, we've talked, and I, I'd like to say this, if I could just add this, sure. and that is, that's really someone who is new to Hampton University, that's really the beauty of Hampton University, where we can do these kinds of projects and really expose students all across the board and give them an opportunity to get their hands dirty and to really understand how science impacts their lives, not only from a quality of life standpoint, but from a monetary standpoint and from the ability to take care of themselves and take care of their families. When we return, more with Dean Pulley about the importance of STEM in the black community. We'll be back in a moment.
The View from Hampton U, bringing you in-depth interviews, cutting-edge research, amazing sports highlights, faculty and student profiles, and much more. I'm Stephanie Sutton. And I'm Joseph Walters. And, and you're, you're watching, watching The View from Hampton U. Welcome back. When we went to break, the discussion on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math was just heating up. Yes, let's get back to it. I, in the opening at the top of the show, talked about the extent to which we celebrate and lionize mm -hmm. some people in certain professions in entertainment and in athletics. Um, is this about society's perception of these disciplines? Is there a communications and marketing challenge that we have? Or are there things that we can do in that regard? I certainly believe if it's exposure. Uh, one of the things that we do with the students, the entire sixth grade at, at James E. Shepard uh, Middle School, is we have a program called Knowledge is Power, where we have STEM professionals, black and Latino, who come in and talk about their careers. And we've had uh, people to come in who are physicians, nurses, uh, a person who sells automobiles who's a mechanical engineer, but mm -hmm. he brought over a 5 Series Beamer that runs off of both electric and gas. Uh, we had a gentleman come all the way from Colorado to talk about safe drinking water equipment that's run off of solar and wind energy. So I think one of the things that you have to do is expose students to the technology, yes. show them that it's cool, and then they get to meet the people and go, well, wait a minute, that person doesn't seem like a nerd. <laughs> and the more the uh, students can see themselves in those roles, then I think we can start to break down the barriers. But yes. right now, when they see an airline pilot only on the TV versus actually seeing it, here is an airline pilot, right. they can begin to go, oh, wow. So there are black airline pilots. Well, are, are we identifying the stars early enough? Are we identifying potential, uh, potential doctors and potential uh, uh, engineers in, very early on? Dr. Lowe, you're, 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 you're in the <laughs> profession of educating these young people. Does your phone ring and someone says, you know, I have this, I'm telling you right now, I have this, this young lady or this young man who you need to track. He or, the, he or she, they're only 12 years old, but it's time to, you know, to put them on your radar. Are we doing that? We are not doing that, um, not, not in any kind of consistent fashion. Uh, you know, in your opening uh, statement, you talked about the, the uh, sports industrial complex that's, mm -hmm. that's set up. Yes. There is not such a thing in, in science. I mean, I don't know who the six-year-olds out there that, uh, that have that spark um, and an interest in, in science are. Uh, but wouldn't but you agree to. that we, should, we could absolutely, if we put our minds to it, identify them just as we can identify LeBron James when he's 12 years old and absolutely. we could tell, I mean, we absolutely. could tell early on that he was going to sure. be a star and he lived absolutely. up to it. That's mm -hmm. right. So. Yeah, I, I think also we, should, we need to think about what we're doing at home you know, um, before our kids get to school uh, and when they come home from school. And that is, make sure that you're nurturing that, that, that very spark that Dr. Lowe speaks about. As parents have to make sure that they're nurturing that. And sometimes, you know, we want to have uh, a clean house. Uh, we want everybody to sit quietly on the couch or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But really, that's kind of working against the scientist because let's face it, the scientist is the person who pushes the boundaries who probably breaks the rules, who probably messed up your kitchen, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and you got to nurture that, I think. And, and, and one of the things that we can do, at a, we're doing at, at the School of Communication at Scripps Howard is hopefully in producing this reality show is uh, kind of, sh you know, kind of bringing it down, if you will. Um, kind of show, it can be fun, you know, that, yeah, your kitchen's messed up or they broke your car or something, but guess what? That's a budding scientist or a budding engineer or a budding mathematician and instead of kind of being mad at them for doing that, to really give them a big hug <laughs> and tell them thank you and send them to Dr. Lowe. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, one thing you can probably be pretty sure of, I would bet that Bill Gates or Steve Jobs at their garage, if not the bedrooms, the garage <laughs> were probably pretty junky. That's, right. Right? That's, right. That's supposedly That's right. where they did a lot of That's work. Right. Uh, let me ask you, Rick, you had mentioned uh, the, the, your work with getting HBCUs involved with some of the initiatives 
uh, that I guess are emanating from Washington. Mm -hmm. Talk a bit about who's funding, who is funding this great need that we're, we're recognizing and talking about. Uh, obviously, it requires that. And how are the HBCUs doing in that regard? Well, there are a couple of people, a couple of persons, as well as ways to fund. A lot of the programs from a global health standpoint are funded by us, the taxpayers, mm -hmm. uh, at the tune of $209 million a year. Mm. Uh, well, over five years, so I mean, you're looking at $45 million for students to go abroad and learn about global health. Are HBCUs benefiting from that? Uh, in this case, no. Mm. Uh, because there are roughly uh, 105 HBCUs now, and the last I heard with that Global Health Fellows Program, there were only two, uh, I believe it was Spelman and Howard, that were given access to the global internships. Now, a lot of students can apply for those internships in D.C., but guess what? You also have to pick up your own bill mm -hmm. during the summer. Unlike the international programs, your immunizations are paid for, your passport is paid for, you're given a stipend, your room and board is paid for. So those are your plum assignments. Again, remembering what I said, 95% of the consumers are outside of the United States. So you need to have that experience. Um, now, from a public-private standpoint, there are some uh, organizations like ExxonMobil, has a pretty uh, great program. They have some uh, projects focused on malaria, and they also have partnered with uh, Dr. Bernard Harris, mm -hmm. a former astronaut, which would be a great program. That program is here in Virginia every summer at UVA. Well, it was the last couple of summers, so one of the things that parents ought to do if they're interested in having their son or daughter participate in science and math that would be a great program. Doesn't cost them anything. Uh, and so go out on the website to ExxonMobil, Bernard Harris Science Camp, because mm -hmm. that would be a fantastic, it's free. free. The View from Hampton U will return in a moment. There was an article where proton therapy was referred to as the holy grail of cancer treatment. I could leave my office, have the treatment, and drive back to work in about an hour and 10 minutes. The Hampton University Proton Therapy Institute is treating prostate, brain, and other cancers with the most precise form of radiation treatment available. It was almost uh, too easy. If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with cancer, call the Hampton University Proton Therapy Institute today. And now, more from The View from Hampton U. So I'd like to ask you all, when it comes to careers in science, technology, engineering, math, let's stick our necks out a little bit. What public entities, private corporations are not doing enough to prepare particularly young minorities, Latinos and African Americans for careers in these professions? Are there some who we should? This is our chance. This is <laughs> Put them, put them on the, put them on the, in the, in the hall of shame. Well, you, uh, you know, if I could just uh, uh, begin, um, I certainly, I can't specifically call names, but I can tell you that if we, if we have to ask that question, then most are probably not doing what they should be doing, because this is, we are Americans. This is our country. Uh, we have to remain competitive. It's very important. We live in a global society, as you said. Other societies are ahead of us, and we cannot afford to allow all these other societies to get ahead of us. So if you're not doing anything, or if you're just doing a little bit, you need to be doing more for your country. So I think most are probably not doing enough. If we, we've got too many African Americans and Latinos and others, I would, I would submit that probably the lower income uh, Asians, lower income whites are probably in trouble as well. So, you know, I just think everybody has to up the ante on it, make it happen, and in your home, you have to start talking about STEM and stop being scared and realize you're doing STEM every day because you know you modified that recipe. <laughs> so let's, you know, yes. get in the game. We gotta be in the game when you're in the game, as we all know. You gotta walk like you're in the game, you gotta talk like you're in the game if you're gonna be in the game, and that's what we have to do. Yes. Uh, and, and thinking about the question, um, when I think of consumer good-related companies, when you think about the amount of money we spend on stuff. Yes. DS. 
Xbox sneakers. The advertisements that the consumer good companies market towards our community. We need to have them market those same number of dollars in investment into elementary and middle schools by uh, helping to develop programs to teach students science, technology, engineering, and math. When I think about uh, the manufacture of sneakers, why not have the research scientists come in to the classroom and talk about how you make yes. a Nike a pair of sneakers? I think those are the kinds of things that we need to do. And then when we have uh, MEAC and CIAA basketball tournaments, take 50 cents from every ticket sold and invest it in the programs back into the schools. That's all it takes, 50 cents. I've done the numbers. And so then you start to build programs mm -hmm. and pipeline and bring the kids to the game so they can see what's going on and then you start to affect change. Those That's would great. be some of the things I would, I would say we need to do. That's great. Well, I think it falls on the parents and on the, um, on the schools and the teachers. We don't work hard enough to identify, recognize, and nurture those students who show interest and talent in the sciences. It's just, they're, just, they're not valuable. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. the, if they can run fast and jump high and mm -hmm. do all that stuff or dance well and play an instrument, you know, um, that stuff we value. That stuff we value. We can see the value in it and and we look for those who have ability in those in, in those areas. We need to look close to folks who have ability and interest in science. And that comes to the parents. I mean, no matter how much money or uh, it comes or not from the outside, from the agencies or from the industries, um, you know, you've got your kids around the table. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. you've got them in the house. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, you know what they're interested in uh, from the time they're little people to, to bigger people. It's great mm -hmm. stuff. Well, I will say this in response to the question about who could perhaps do more. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, to his credit, gave $100 million to public schools in the city of Newark. Google, to its credit, I just read today, has given $2 million for free college preparatory classes for needy high school students. Now, contributions like these are indeed laudable. However, let's look at a couple of other statistics. Facebook, as of today, has a market value of $141 billion and over $3 billion in cash on hand. This is just cash, sitting in the bank, waiting to be used for something. Google has a market value, as of today, of $375 billion and over $50 billion in cash on hand. Apple has $147 billion in cash. My point is these companies have tremendous resources, thanks largely to a consumer base that is very much comprised of the people we have been talking about on this show today, young people, young minorities. We have the ability to address this problem. All we need is the will. Thank you very much. So I really learned a lot about STEM today, Joe. Yes, I did too. And if you'd like to learn more about STEM programs at Hampton University, please visit www.hamptonu.edu. We'll see you next week. With the brain tumor, there was that possibility of blindness, especially with my daughter's wedding coming up. You want to be able to see those things. The Hampton University Proton Therapy Institute is treating prostate, brain, and other cancers with the most precise form of radiation treatment available. It is the absolute best way to go. If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with cancer, call the Hampton University Proton Therapy Institute today. Join us next week for another exciting episode of The View from Hampton U.